A halal meal prep service. Is that too much to ask? Well, not anymore. Before we start this episode, I want to let you guys know about our sponsor, Lions Prep. Lions Prep are the UK's highest rating halal meal plan service. They freshly prepare meals that are ready in just three minutes in the microwave, all delivered right to your door. I've always romanticized the idea of meal preps. Convenience, not needing to cook, having someone to calculate the macros for me, it's the dream. But I never thought it would be me, at least not until I'm super wealthy. However, I've been having meal plans now for about three or four weeks and it's been an absolute game changer. I think one of the biggest myths is that they have to be expensive and Lion's Prep meals start from just four pounds. They're chef cooked, delicious, healthy, convenient and halal. So how it works is you choose from a selection of chef cooked dishes from the weekly changing menu. All meals are nutritionally balanced and portion controlled, making it easy to stay healthy without any hassle. When I explain how productive this has made me, not thinking about meals and how easy it has been to stay on diet. And when you're on diet, you feel sharp, man. Anyway, try Lions Prep today with an exclusive discount for new customers. You get 30% off week one, 15% off weeks two and three, and an extra 15% off week four at lionsprep.co.uk. That's L. L-I-O-N-S-P-R-E-P dot co dot UK and enter promo code FG23. And remember, if you're ever away, you can skip any deliveries easily online or via their brand new app. Check out Lions Prep. You won't regret it. And we are on. Asalaamu Alaikum, Munir. Wa Alaikum as -salam. How's it going? How are we doing? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair for uh, jumping on, man. We haven't uh, met before, so uh, we're doing this live in public uh, in front of everybody. Uh, Alhamdulillah. So uh, I had a question for you because I, I checked out your, uh, your I checked out your socials, man. Really, really cool stuff. I want to dig into it a bit of it, but uh, before we do, uh, there's this like kind of measurement of a successful or clear personal brand, which is whether you know it can be explained in in one sentence and uh, Chris Doe in his branding workshop goes a step further and he's like you should be able to explain clearly what you do in two words so I'm going to ask you what is it that you do or what is it that you're like kind of pushing forward in two words if I only get two words Muslim yep. fitness if I get Amazing. a sentence it would be Let's getting, give a sentence. The, getting the Muslim umma healthy and fit for life inshallah that's really interesting. I find that interesting because when I was browsing your socials, uh, here's something I really, really liked about it. There was uh, a bunch of content about fitness, of course. Muslim fitness seems to be geared towards men, which is great. But there seems to be sprinkled within there every few posts. I don't know if you're doing it less now, but within every few posts, there seems to be sprinkled in the concept of respect and more specifically gaining respect as a Muslim man which I love and uh, so I think uh, is that something that you're kind of passionate about and so every now and again you just like throw that in is it intentional what's the reason behind that and uh, I think you should throw that into your two word uh, description man. at least your one-liner because I love that man and I think that I want to delve into that actually a bit more but uh, yeah is that intentional absolutely yes it is because one of the biggest things is you know, a lot of people need more than just a surface level reason to want to get fit and be in shape. Cause like, you know, you take a 35 or 45 year old Muslim father, you know, having a six pack is not going to motivate him to get up out of bed in the morning when he's tired, when his newborn was keeping him up all night and he's got a 12 hour workday ahead of him. It's not going to motivate him to get up and go to the gym and eat healthy. The thing that's going to motivate him to be healthy is number one, doing it for the sake of Allah and realizing that it's going to make him a better version of himself in every area of both deen and dunya. He's going to have more energy. He's going to have more self-respect. He's going to have more confidence. He's going to have a more positive energy about him. And he's going to be a more disciplined individual who's able to be a better Muslim, a better man, and a better version of himself across all walks of life. And really respect is something that we as men all seek, you know, respect, power, all these different things. It's kind of like a base desire that men have. Um, but then, of course, you know, as Muslim men, we not only want that, but we want to do it for the sake of Allah. We want to use that power for good. We want to be grateful to Allah for giving us that power, giving us the opportunity to be alive, giving us the ability to take action as somebody who deserves to be respected. And so I think, you know, when we loop it all in together, I always like to tie it in with what is the deeper level why behind our actions, because that's the thing that, you know, helps to create that permanent transformation as opposed to just, cool, I'm going to be fit for six weeks, for 12 weeks, but then I'm going to go back to my old ways. Now it's like, hey, this is a motivation to have a permanent lifestyle change and execute the day of the discipline every single day, in addition to having the right strategy that makes it sustainable as well. So it is intentional to answer your question. Yeah, I love that, man, because I've, it weirdly, 
in private circles, it's probably the most recurring co conversation that I have with with people. This concept of respect, and um, and and it, I, in fact, I had it as early as as recently as today uh, with uh, with one of our team members. And what I was kind of saying is that Islam has no space for arrogance, uh, but. Izzah, on the other end, is such an important and high um, part of Islam and such a, a, a important part of being a man and is Islamically um, favoured. It's a good thing to have Izzah, to have honour. And so where do you, and, I, and the, the conversation tends to go down the line of like, so where do you differentiate honour and uh, arrogance? And what I tend to like say in these kind of private discussions uh, with brothers and, 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 and people younger than myself is that... Um, Essentially, you have to be able to uh, have find that um, line and understand that while you can't be arrogant, it's very important to uh, walk like a man, to talk like a man, to behave like a man, and to have that izza so that when you walk into a room, essentially nobody uh, like uh, kind of mocks you or uh, so that you have that level of respect. And I think I learned that uh, myself through going through that journey where, you know, in my early days, now like 10 years ago when I started creating content, I would be very keen and eager to uh, make myself the butt of the joke. And I think there's good in that, by the way, uh, which is that um, you kind of make people feel comfortable, you're not mocking others and stuff like that. But there's also a level where you can go so far where people feel like they can make uh, uh, fun of you as well, which is obviously something that we don't want. And so it's important to always have that balance and to ensure that people respect you and you kind of lay down the law. And so I really, um, yeah, I really resonate with that, man. I think that's a really cool thing that we need to speak more about, this idea of is uh, of honor and of uh, of trying to create that level of respect with Without having without having arrogance, which I think, like I said, is a thin line. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's uh, it's a commandment from Allah, right? The man's responsibility is to be qawam, which means protector, right? And in order to protect your family, you can't be this weak and frail individual who can't fight, who doesn't even have the confidence to stand up for what he believes is right, and who isn't somebody who's going to conduct himself in alignment and integrity with his values, which is a large part of what honor is, is being in integrity with your values, standing up for those values and not letting them become trampled upon. And so when we have a duty towards our wife or towards, you know, our uh, children, whatever it may be, or to our family in general, right? It's very important that we are somebody who carries himself with honor. And I think that's part of what differentiates. I mean, ar arrogance goes into multiple facets, like looking down on others is obviously a facet of arrogance. But I think another one of the different differentiating characteristics between, you know, being a stand-up kind of man with honor and integrity is you're doing it for a higher purpose than just your own ego versus a person who's just arrogant or postures for the sake of inflating his own ego and his own status for selfish intent. Again, it's a very selfish intent versus that helping society, serving Allah, being a better slave of Allah by serving those around us. And again, protecting our wives, protecting our children, protecting our families and protecting our deen, right? So... Yeah, I, I think like there's there's two extremes to this. Like sometimes we, we often think about the extreme of like being arrogant, but then there's the, the there's the opposite end, which is sometimes when we fall in love with the religion, we can uh, emanate this uh, level of humility, which again is important because uh, humility is a big part of our. Um, it is it, fundamental in our in the practice of our religion. We must be humble. But I think sometimes people can often mistake humility for, like I said, essentially like maybe even having a weakness or not standing up for yourself, not having a backbone. And there has to be that balance where you can have that honor and not necessarily and not lose uh, the humility. And I kind of wonder where, um, like I said, where kind of people go get, maybe get the balance with that wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is like what what makes a person feel the need to put down others and inflate their own ego. And I think part of it is a lack of taqwa, right? Because when you love and fear Allah, that combination of love and fear for somebody who's infinitely greater than we are as human beings kind of keeps you humble by default. And it also aligns your intentions, because if you fear Allah's punishment for doing something wrong and you love Allah to where the love of Allah uh, fuels everything that you do. It helps you to avoid having that selfish and negative intent. It helps you to control your desires. So I think that's kind of the the first part of it. Um, and I would, I mean, I, I think actually really taqwa probably solves all of it because <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking somebody who who truly has taqwa, who truly loves and fears Allah, 
uh, would be able to control any selfish desire that they may naturally have, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of, you know, whatever may be inside of them or whatever evil shaitan or their nefs may be whispering to them. So, um, so I think Thupla solves it, but I'd love to hear your thought on that as well. <laughs> it, it does, but I, I wonder if insecurity plays a, a big part as well. Mm-hmm. I think it does actually, you're right, because uh, you could have Thupla, but if you're insecure, and like you feel the need to posture yourself or bring others down in order to make yourself look better in comparison. Um, and I'm sure that you get this as much as I do, like hate comments on social media, for instance, like people who will yeah. tear, will nitpick and tear down one thing just for the sake of like, you know, because you can tell they're insecure. And then sometimes they'll even use a slam and say, and, and try to like use a slam as a justification to bring somebody down. Like, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. That's haram, even though it's like something that's not even haram. And just, I don't know, stuff like that. So so I think insecurity definitely plays a role, which is all the more reason to build ourselves and become more confident versions of ourselves from a very authentic and genuine place, because then we're not insecure, but we have real confidence instead of needing to fake it by being, you know, arrogant or cocky, you know what I mean? Yeah, and and then the, so agreed completely. I think like as you get older as well, I'm not sure how how, how old are you, Monia? Uh, Twenty nine. Okay, we're the exact same age. Uh, so uh, as you get older, I think you realize as well you can start you start finding um, the trait of auth- authenticity incredibly attractive in others, and uh, that's something that perhaps uh, as in your younger years you don't necessarily have. In your younger years, you tend to get uh, the 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 wool pulled over your eyes a lot easier, and so now. <clears throat> Where when when kind of you you get older, you're going a family, you're um, you're you're comfortable with your your income and, and so on and so forth. You stop um, valuing the conversations where perhaps you're having discussions with the younger people and they feel the need to have conversations about their uh, income, uh, or you can kind of see through inauthentic conversation. And you're like, man, like it's super chill, man. We're all like, no one here is uh, insecure. We're all good. Like we don't need to have conversations where sometimes people, it kind of feels like people like throw pot things in conversation to almost uh, defend their ego. And so I think that's the beautiful thing about growing older as a man is that you start becoming more relaxed and uh, yeah, like secure, less insecure. I think it, it perhaps is one of those things that comes with age. But um, what, the other thing I wanted to touch on was you mentioned uh, right at the beginning of this conversation, you said, uh, I asked you about respect and you said that it's a baseline feeling that we kind of require as men. And I think that couldn't be closer to the truth, man, because sometimes you, you, you can ask a man about something or you can ask a man for something or to do something or, or a question. And if the man feels respected when he is asked that um, or not, completely changes the outcome so oft, often I guess what I'm getting at is oftentimes uh, me personally perhaps I have an issue I don't know but me personally with uh, people that perhaps I feel uh, it's important that I carry that kind of level of respect around perhaps maybe like younger siblings or family or uh, whatever it may be um, it, it's not often the thing the end result that uh, that is difficult for me it's the way in which that uh, end result is uh, is kind of asked about right and if you feel like, like it's a classic example of um it's a classic example of if if somebody uh, was to ask you uh, if you want to like sit at the front of a car, for example, like your younger sibling was like, oh, oh do you want to sit at the front? Nine times out of 10, you don't care. It's like, no, I don't care. But the fact that if they were to like not ask, you'd be like, hey, man, why are you just jumping in the front of the car? Like I'm like five years older than you and like have some respect. And so I hope that doesn't kind of breed the idea of arrogance. I, I, but more so, um, I think a man requires respect when he feels, well, at least in, in situations where he feels like there's that dynamic. Uh, and then when he gets that respect, he's actually much more easygoing and lenient. Would you agree or am I just speaking out of like pure ego here? <laughs> no, no, I think it's very true. Like if somebody feels disrespected, they're going to kind of automatically disagree with what you're asking them to do. Just because right. even if you would have normally agreed with it, the way it was asked uh, certainly makes you not want to agree to it, even if it was something that you wanted. Like, And, and I think this applies in so many different ways. Like people don't want to be forced into something or coerced into something or to do something begrudgingly. People want to be able to act in their own best interest while also acting in the best interest of those around them because that's what creates a win-win and that's kind of the collaborative spirit that i think that we as human beings and as muslims should be with each other and with humanity as a whole is why don't we have that collaborative spirit where everybody wins because i feel that's the most islamic solution 
versus a competitive, you know, in contrast, competitor versus collaborative, very competitive frame towards each other where it's like, oh, I got to out alpha you or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. people are all, like, the, like the younger guys are always trying to out alpha each other, like, oh, I make this much money. Oh, I make this much money. Oh, I can lift this much. Oh, I can lift this much. It's like, hey, man, why don't I be happy for you that you can lift that much and you be happy for me that I can lift this much? And then let's, let's lift that much together and lift each other's spirits up and help each other. Yeah, be exactly. More. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think that perfectly encapsulates it. Like, I think on the other end, respect goes both ways and you must give it as well. Even as a man, it's not that I must receive all respect, but um, in, in, in all situations, in all circles, you must give respect. And uh, when you give respect, you often find that uh, uh, conversations are easier. Um, people have their guard down uh, and you can start to build uh, relationships that matter because there are there is mutual respect there. So, um, so yeah, as much as I, I suppose like this is this baseline thing that, that men seem to require, um, it's also something that by default, you as a man must be mature enough to give respect. Uh, and, and that comes in different formats. The fact that you're, ju you're jumping on this podcast and, um, and coming with your energy and you're coming with your A-game, that's, that's a sign of respect. It's like, oh man, this guy like values it. He's not just coming here with like, you know, uh, you're asking, is my camera okay? Is my mic okay? That's in itself a kind of respectful thing and it, it's something that is appreciated. So I don't think it always has to come in such a aggressive manner, but uh, I think it's important for one to kind of give it as well as receive it, right? Mm, 1000%. I mean, it's all about reciprocity. And I think that we as men and as humans and as Muslims should always bring our A game to every situation because if the other person is bringing their A game, it creates a net positive vortex. And if the other person isn't, you're going to have to carry that person. <laughs> and number mm -hmm. three, uh, I think it's just, I mean, I, I, so here's the thing. I, I read a very amazing, I mean, all the hadiths are amazing, of course, but like this hadith, they're really spoke to this idea which is that allah has prescribed excellence in all things and uh, the hadith goes on uh, to give examples of like different areas to practice excellence but the fact that ihsan excellence is prescribed in all things by allah i mean it, it really speaks to me like for instance if i notice myself and i'm waking up and i'm hitting snooze it's like hey that's not excellence why am i making the first decision of my day from a place of anything less than excellence why don't i get wow, up that's right cool, away man. 100% and, and just get up right away and set that momentum for the rest of the day because you know, we're, we're human, we're not going to be perfect, but can we at least strive for perfection and then be compassionate with ourselves if we fall short of that, but then strive for it the next time, right? And I think that's something that anybody, you know, uh, viewing this can take away from this is strive for excellence in everything you do because Allah has prescribed it for us. And why has Allah prescribed it for us? Well, Allah is the one who created us. He knows us best and he knows that we're happiest when we're pursuing excellence. And so it ties back in with the idea of self-respect when you realize that the whole like narrative that society has sold us of comfort and laziness and easiness and all that stuff is actually a scam <laughs> and the place where we're actually the happiest where we're working hard and striving for excellence uh you know i recently wrote that down on my phone as a note laziness is a scam the thing that actually makes you happy is working hard uh i think it really does translate positively to all areas of our life and helps us be a better muslim a better man a better person across every area alhamdulillah so uh, so um the, let's let's dig in a bit because um, uh, well, one of the things that you said as well is that you know you get hate comments as everybody does and I'm sure you don't get many but I wonder like how, you know the conversation that you're having the, the 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 narrative that you're that you're that you're speaking about here right now um, I can't imagine that anybody would have anything negative to say about it like um calling for respect calling for uh, a person to to strive in excellence uh I, I the only you know i wonder why it is what kind of hate comments do you get if you do get kind of negative comments is it kind of more aligned with like hey man like be easy on people or or your toxic i imagine you must get hit with the toxic masculinity thing uh, <laughs> once or twice is that the kind of like uh, nature of the messages Weirdly enough, I don't get the toxic masculinity thing a whole lot, okay. um, but people are just like nitpicking things or, and, and oftentimes it's a misunderstanding and, you know, I'm a big believer that, uh, and I think, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was a hadith or if it was a saying of uh, one of the Sahaba, but uh, basically it was like, you know, make excuses for your brothers, right? Assume the best of your fellow Muslim. Yep. So like, yep. I always try yep. to assume, and I, and, and I have to remind myself of this sometimes, because sometimes when you get a comment that sounds very disrespectful, your first gut reaction is to get angry, but then it's like, wait a second, what excuses can I make for my fellow Muslim here? Maybe they meant something else. Maybe they misinterpreted something I said to where I could take ownership for how I could better communicate that message. So, uh, so sometimes it's that where people just like uh, misunderstand something. Sometimes it's like uh, just people kind of nitpicking for no reason. Uh, sometimes it's people offering genuine feedback and when I reframe it and I, you know, take in that feedback, it's a positive thing. Um, 
it also sometimes is people saying that like certain things are haram. Like actually sometimes I have people say like, hey, wear a long sleeve shirt and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I always cover my aura, right? Cause that's, that's what's important. And I understand like modesty, like obviously, you know, if, if you're going to be praying, you know, if, if all you have is a sleeveless shirt, you can pray in a sleeveless shirt, but obviously I've heard that it's better. Uh, there's a Mufti who I follow, who uh, I respect a lot. And he said, it is better to like cover more of yourself when you pray. Uh, so that's what I heard from him. So obviously, you know, that's the case, but if I'm a fitness coach and I'm trying to inspire the youth as well as brothers in their thirties and forties to be more fit, doesn't it benefit them? to see that they can respect and uh, appreciate that I practice what I preach in the message, right? It's gonna, it, it always performs better. The, the content's gonna reach more people. So like people just nitpicking little things like that. Again, you know, I, I always try to assume the best of people. And if somebody's, even if somebody drops a very rude and hateful comment or calls me stupid or whatever, or like nitpick something I said in, a, in the most negative way possible, that person's probably going through something. And so the best thing that we can do for them is make dua that Allah eases whatever they're struggling with. And of course, stand up for the truth in the comments, but in a respectful way. And uh, I think that's the best thing we can do in this situation. But yeah, it's typically either a nitpick or, uh, yeah, I'd say the nitpicking is probably the biggest one. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Uh, okay, so like you said at the beginning of the episode that uh, you would describe yourself as kind of like helping Muslims in their fitness journey. I'd like to dig into that a bit more, just understand your mission and uh, how you execute that mission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the, I would say that the, there's many ways to execute that mission because everybody has different issues specific to them that have helped so is that, how is it specifically that you execute the mission so i've seen obviously you're putting out social posts and stuff like that i think you might have a course and I, it seems that um you're quite um kind of more so focused on uh kind of overweight muslims losing weight is that the kind of like uh general narrative and and what 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 um yeah, like what kind of execution are you doing on that? Is it is your main focus like Instagram clips? Is it like uh, the course? Is it personal PTing? Or is it like an array of things? You personally? Yeah, it's a combination of uh, content, mostly Instagram, and then our coaching program. Um, and so the, the principle behind all of the things, though, kind of falls into the three main categories, which is people either struggle with nutrition, with exercise, with consistency, time management, lifestyle, motivation, kind of all those factors, uh, or a combination of the three. And so all of the posts are geared generally towards solving a problem within one of those three spheres. So for instance, a big common reason why a lot of Muslims struggle to get in shape is maybe they've done diets before, maybe they've lost weight before, but if they have to eat separate food from the family because their family's making something very decadent and delicious that they grew up eating, that their family all enjoyed, and they have to eat like chicken and broccoli, then obviously that's not a sustainable solution. So one of the biggest uh, changes that I seek to make within the mindset that we as a Muslim Ummah have towards fitness is fitness doesn't mean restriction. It definitely doesn't mean discipline. Like as a man, you should be going and training your body anyways. You know, uh, the Sahabas were all warriors, so let that be your motivation. Plus you're just gonna feel better. But when it comes to nutrition, obviously it's a resistance point if we have to eat separate meals from the family. So the key is how do we take some of these delicious cultural foods and make a healthy version of that that tastes exactly the same or at least as close to the same as possible, but fits the right nutrition is needed for health, for taking care of the body, the amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, for giving us longevity, better energy levels, losing weight, building muscle. So generally what we want to do is we want to remove any ingredients that are causing like bloating and inflammation. So any of like the unhealthy junk, which I've got a lot of resources that go like pretty deep into that, uh, lowering the calories and then increasing the protein content of these meals. And generally that's the strategy that we use that allows our clients as well as our viewers to be able to lose weight without ever feeling like they're on a diet. And the recipes usually taste so good that their family can't even tell the difference to where now they're passing on what I call generational health, which is like generational <laughs> wealth, but I fitness. love this. Yeah, humble line. So it's like a ripple. Did effect, you come right? up with because, that? Uh, I think I did. I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> I think did I hear that from somewhere? Man, you got to, you got to trademark that, man. We got to check if that domain is available. Uh, you got to take that off the off the market. Uh, hey, well, you know what? Uh, I, I encourage all other fitness coaches to say generational health too, because then it's a ripple effect. Yeah, for sure. So, and, and that's and that's what's all about, man. It's all about the southern pajaria. Because think about it: the reason why we have these unhealthy recipes they were passed down from our ancestors, and so we kind of have this generational curse of obesity because we're eating these foods that are just way too high in calories and make us inflamed and tired and obese. Versus if we can break that cycle with ourselves and our family and pass on generational health, our progeny, inshallah, will never have these issues that we had with their health and fitness because they learned how to eat healthy from the default. And that's just within nutrition. We could talk more about exercise and, uh, and motivation too. But, you know, that's that's probably one of the biggest ones is just the nutritional component, which is probably the most common struggle I hear. Like probably 80% of the time people struggle with nutrition. So, Yeah, you know what? I, um, I kind of struggled with nutrition 
uh, over the years. No, I didn't struggle with nutrition, but I, I, I understood, I've understood more over the last kind of five years the importance of nutrition. And so I've, I've probably for over the last five years just been more, um, in, uh, I've had more intention with what I eat. I'm aware of what I eat. And, uh, and, um, and the thing that I think I recently have been struggling with living here in Dubai, right, is that it's currently 50 to 48 degrees Celsius, uh, like 50, I recently hit 50 degrees Celsius, it's like, it, it's crazy hot, right, and so I'm currently spending, um, so I should prerequisite it by saying that I built a gym in my back garden, and so that was all good, because I built it in the winter, so like, all good until it started hitting 45 degrees, so now it's like so, and, 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 and on top of that, I was walking to the masjid, so I was loving life, man. I had my discipline right. I was walking to the masjid, which was like, there and back was, I think, was like 2,000 steps. So you even do that three times a day. You're getting 6,000 steps just going to the uh, to the masjid. And then you're getting all the other steps throughout the day and you're working out and stuff like that. As soon as it hits summer, like where you're seeing me sat right now is like where I'm sitting for like 12 hours a day. And I'm like, I'm going to the masjid in the car. I'm, I'm not working out in the garden because it's so hot. And then it's like, I get one hour window where it's not too hot to work out. And so if I miss that one hour window in the, in the, in the day, it's like, all right, now I can't work out for today. And um, so what I found is that I, for like the last few years, I realized that it really is like 80% nutrition. And over the last few weeks, I realized as much as it is 80% nutrition, you can't just sit <laughs> on a chair for 12 plus hours and still eat good. You will still be in a calorie uh, uh, surplus because of the fact that you're just like not moving enough. So uh, I've learned in the last few weeks that movement is uh, just as important as diet. And I need to figure out a way of moving, uh, moving some more. <laughs> 100%. Well, I have some ideas for you. And uh, just on the note of like 80% diet, yeah, like uh, I'd I say, I say maybe a more accurate one is 80% of people where they screw up is diet because working out for many people is the easy part. Um, however, it's 100% diet, it's 100% nutrition, or sorry, it's 100% diet, it's 100% training, because both of the two have to work in conjunction together to get you yeah, in that makes sense. Right? So for you, what I would say is what could work really well considering, because you know I've got clients, I have a couple clients in Dubai, I have clients who are in like Houston, Texas, which is also like not fun to go outside right now because it's like hot and humid, like over 100 right. degrees Fahrenheit, I think it's like in the upper 40 Celsius. So like, uh, so what I have them do is get an under the desk treadmill and I actually have one here. So this desk goes up, you can uh, turn into a standing desk and I have a treadmill that I can just slide underneath, uh, like a walking pad. And the beautiful thing with that is that you'll like, you'll turn it on, you'll start walking and you'll get immersed into your work or into zoom meetings or whatever it may be. Obviously you may, might not want to do it on podcast and your shoulders going to be like moving up and down. Yeah. Like, but, like a zooming. I work is like, <laughs> that's hilarious. Exactly. So. So like, but, but if you're doing like, uh, and some deep work, you may want to be like seat and focused, but if it's just like, you know, maybe a team meeting or something, you actually find you have more energy when you're walking. And so that's what I love doing. Like yesterday, for instance, I was behind on steps cause I didn't have as much time to work out in the morning as I normally would. So for my last two hours of meetings that day, I just popped on the treadmill and all my clients like thought it was funny because you know, I'm still just as competent, if anything, higher energy because I'm moving around. But so what is uh, that called? A, a, a under the desk treadmill? I'm just looking up. I'm looking up yeah. it now. I'm looking it up now. Yes, yes, yeah, like a walking pad or under the desk treadmill with a standing desk. And actually, uh, one of my clients in Dubai uh, was one of the first ones who adopted the strategy when we started working together mm. a while back. So I know you can get them on Amazon Dubai <laughs> and uh, or Amazon yeah, UAE. Yeah, looking at it now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so it's like, you know, a couple hundred bucks and it's a great investment and it helps you get your steps on autopilot because let's say you, you set it and forget it, you're on two hours of meetings, you all of a sudden check your step count, like, you know, two hours later and boom, all of a sudden you're at like 10,000 steps. You're like, well, it's like a cheat code. <laughs> like literally it's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, it is one of the strategies that works. Cause we have some guys who work up to like 80, 90, hundred hours a week. So like for them, this is kind of the only strategy that works because they don't actually even have time to go outside to walk, even if the weather's nice, you know? So that's a but really cool you, idea. I've seen on, I've seen it like, you know, you see it online on TV or something and it looks like, it just looks super awkward, but it makes a lot of sense because you're just getting those steps in while you work. I'd have to get this. I've invested so much in my desk. I couldn't bear the thought of all of that going to waste and replacing with a standing desk. But I'm sure I could like shove a chair on top of like the table behind me or something and then just like put my laptop on it on parts of the day. But that's really, really cool, man. I like the idea of that. Mm -hmm, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And you could even like maybe you have your main desk, but if you're doing like a little bit of laptop work and want to switch up the environment a bit, stimulate new thoughts. You can, you know, get a standing desk for that, or again, do the chair thing on your desk, get the little treadmill thing. So there's a lot of different like creative ways you can fit it in. 
But yeah, that is where we kind of have to do a little bit of, uh, you know, schedule gymnastics to make sure it fits in a sustainable way for you where you're still able to get your steps. But yeah, mashallah, when you were describing like being able to walk to the masjid, getting your steps and, you know, making your prayers in Jemaah in the masjid every day, man, that's just, you know, it's, it's such a beautiful dream come true. And that's one of the reasons why I'm highly considering moving to Dubai because it's, uh, it's beautiful. You got to come out here, man. Oh, inshallah. Absolutely, man. Yes, sir. Hey, man, after, after the podcast, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll grab your number. And um, if you have any questions about it, man, like or, or in terms of like how, how to go about it or how I went about it or anything, I'm definitely more than happy to help. But come down and check it out. I think it's um, uh, it's, it's best decision, one best decision I've made, honestly. It's really, really, really cool. And, and you know what? Even even with regards to Salah, walking to the masjid, I think I'm kind of making an excuse because at this point, uh, you could still at least for Isha and Maghrib, get yourself to the masjid by walking you might at maghrib time get a tad bit sweaty but like nothing crazy not like to the point where you know it's could be impermissible for you to go to the masjid because you, you smell so much so you, i could still probably get an extra four thousand steps but i think you know you just get used to the idea oh, i'm driving to the masjid and and then you start to, or you run late one day and you're like oh, i've got to drive but yeah i think i'm going to try and make those changes uh you mentioned steps uh getting your daily steps and stuff are you do you count your steps uh how many steps do you try and get in, in a day um and do you recommend that people kind of are conscious of their steps absolutely absolutely so that falls into the exercise side of things so once you've got nutrition reasonably dialed in you know within 80 percent uh so like you know 80 20 rule you have it reasonably close to perfection without it being impossible to stick to, then we definitely want to talk about exercise. So step count is probably one of the most important driving factors behind losing weight and keeping it off as well. I mean, you don't have to do as many steps to keep the weight off as you do to lose it, but certainly a person who's not getting enough steps, even if they're in like calorie deficit with their diet is going to lose weight much slower, if at all, than somebody who has a high step count who's going to be able to lose a lot more easily. So for me personally, I always get at least 10,000. Um, alhamdulillah. Like if I, if it's very rare that I got under 10,000, um, and you know, for clients, it really depends on them. Cause like some clients will come in and they're only doing two to 3000 a day to where if I even get them doing four five, six, seven, eight thousand, 8,000, that's going to make a very big difference. But other clients are already doing like six, so we can up to like eight to 10 right away. I mean, it just depends on the individual, how active they already are and you know, how serious they are. I mean, obviously they need to be serious enough to be committed, of course, but like not, not so much how serious are they, but like how motivated are they to make as much change as possible? Cause like, for instance, I had a guy actually yesterday, he just signed up and we're like, Hey, the first month, we don't even need to worry about step count. Let's just focus on lifting, getting you consistent. And he hops to a meeting yesterday and he's like, yeah, let me just, let's, let's go to 10K steps right away. And I actually have to be like, okay, cool. Well, right now you're at two, 3,000. So let's start like six to 9,000 yeah. and then we'll do. So, but, but I always want to capitalize on personal motivation versus you might have some people who are very resistant yeah. to it. They're already too overwhelmed by their schedule to where you can barely increase it. But yeah, I recommend for everybody that you just focus on getting more steps. And it doesn't mean you have to like go for walks all the time. I mean, walking is great, especially walking in nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us in the Quran to reflect upon his creation, upon nature. And it does bring you closer with Allah when you have that appreciation and you appreciate what Allah has created for us in this beautiful world. But at the same time, you know, uh, there's ways to make it more productive. For instance, uh, one really great Islamic uh, practice you can do. So obviously there's a hadith where if you say, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, 100 times, then your sins will be forgiven even if they're as great as the foam of the sea. Well, guess what? You can go for a five, 10 minute walk and say, subhanAllah, wa bihamdihi a hundred times easily every single day. Boom, there's 10 minutes of walking right there and you're getting all your sins forgiven. You can listen to Quran. Maybe you find a surah that's a certain length of time and you listen to it once or twice during your walk. Boom, now you're listening to, you know, like I have a, a client who likes to listen to Surah Yasin twice and he'll listen to Surah Yasin and it corresponds perfectly with the distance of his walk around his neighborhood. And he does it every day as like a daily routine for both Islamic purposes and for fitness purposes. You can take your kids to the park, play with your kids right? You can do so many different things to multitask that time and get multiple ROIs, multiple returns on your investment of time with that time that allows it to, again, have multiple purposes, multiple benefits and fit into your lifestyle in a more harmonious way. So those are just some ideas. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I like that a lot, man. I was While you were talking, I just had to look at my uh, steps for today. And uh, I'm at 5,000. I'm like, oh, man, I've got to get this up now. So it is like easy, like you said, there's easy wins to get those steps up. So for sure, um that's interesting because yeah I, I, like i said i've realized now that movement is so important so you, you speak you spoke about uh, a few times about uh, people jumping on or, or your clients and stuff like that so how, how does that work so you have a is it like an online platform or I, i'd love to learn a bit more about what you offer in terms of your services and, and what people get out of it 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So we have an online fitness. By the way, I should program. mention that this is like not in any way like a partnership, like a sponsored episode with you, yeah, like yeah. That because people will be like, "Oh man, you're like feeding in for like promo." I, I genuinely am like super intrigued. So uh, yeah, oh, feel free to like feel free to like self promote while I while I understand what it is that you do. Oh, it's not fair. We'll also make it like valuable for the viewers. Like even somebody who doesn't have any intention of ever having a coach, you'll still be able to learn some insights for what we do for clients because you'll understand like how comprehensive your own process needs to be, even if you're doing this on your own. And of course, anybody who's interested in coaching, you can check out my uh, social media and have details on my website. But yeah, so basically what we do is uh, I've sought to make this a very A to Z service because kind of like my biggest thing is I'm very OCD and I want to remove every single reason why somebody could possibly fail, especially because if somebody gives me money, I'm going to feel bad if they fail unless they literally just didn't do what was required. Like if somebody doesn't respond to my messages, then there's not really a whole lot I can do. So obviously there's certain expectations that need to be met where somebody needs to be communicative. But like, yeah, so if you if you fulfill on all the work, I wanna make sure that I remove all obstacles. So obviously we cover nutrition and I'll talk a little bit about that. We cover the exercise side of things. We cover the accountability, the mindset, the motivation, the lifestyle optimization, making it sustainable. So within nutrition, obviously we set up a nutrition plan that nutritionally suits the calorie needs, the protein, carb, and fat needs that you have, as well as which foods you like and don't like and which foods you can digest easily versus which ones cause digestive issues. And that's a very unique genetic thing. Like for instance, even Mm. a food that would be very healthy like broccoli, some people are gonna get digestive issues from it and some people are not. So if you're watching this right now, you can kind of diagnose yourself and say, okay, cool. If I notice I feel really bloated and gassy every time I eat broccoli, even if I like broccoli, I probably shouldn't eat it because I'm getting bloated and gassy. And not only for the people around me who don't wanna smell the gas, but number two for myself, because I wanna be bloated and tired and lethargic, uh, you should cut that out because it's not good for your system to constantly be bloated, right? Uh, some people, for instance, respond really well to oatmeal. They get great results from it, good energy levels, good fat loss, versus others get bloated. So again, you would want to cut it out if it makes you bloated. So uh, there's all that. And then on the nutrition side, again, creating recipes. Uh, we obviously already have a bunch of recipes, but like the ones that an individual needs to make things sustainable with them and their family so that they can eat the same foods as their family and their family can eat the same foods as them and everybody enjoys it and they're getting the results they want. That's the other component within nutrition that basically removes every single reason why somebody could fail. Oh, and also like time management wise, like if somebody needs to eat out or snack, we can accommodate that in. Or if somebody doesn't know how to meal prep, we can teach them how to meal prep. In fact, with almost everybody, I have them learn how to meal prep because I think it's a valuable skill. Uh, It's very important to make sure that you're on point with your nutrition. So that's nutrition and then exercise. Obviously, we customize everything. We have technique reviews to make sure that, you know, people can send in videos and have my coaching team review it and fix their form so they're not going to hurt themselves. We cover like the warm-up routine. We customize every aspect of the program. I mean, obviously, there are many similarities because the human body is a human body, but within that, there are also differences, right? Like there are over 70 different archetypes of human bodies that we've had to create 70 different sort of structures and frameworks for that we then customize to the individual to ensure that an individual is able to get the right programming for their goals, their leverages, their needs, their fitness level, their age, any past injuries they've had, et cetera. Uh, so very detailed and obviously the step count optimizing it for lifestyle. And then last component is like actually making sure it fits into their lifestyle and that we're coaching past any sort of mindset or motivational issues that an individual is having. Of course, even in the beginning, before we take somebody on as a client, we do have a consultation with them when we figure out what is their why, because that's important is they need to have a strong enough why that the reason to take action is greater than the resistance so that they can overcome, get out of their comfort zone and grow as a person to be successful in this fitness journey, as well as other areas of life. And a big thing, again, a lot of people, the reason why they struggle with this is because they lack a sense of control over their life. They lack that psychological sort of ownership and uh, ability to push through those obstacles. That's the big thing we work on with them as well as the psychological component and just making sure that we're again, handling every logistical, psychological, nutritional, uh, body-wise, physical limitation that a person can have to ensure there's no reason why they can fail. So it's very A to Z, takes a lot of work on our end, but alhamdulillah, the results are worth it. And being able to see people change their lives, being able to even just get a text message from a client about how much their life has changed or to have a check-in with them or some of our testimonials when a client will just share everything that's changed for them, that makes it all worth it. And it reminds me why we do this. And it reminds me, and it allows me to be closer with Allah because I can have gratitude that Allah gave me the opportunity to help all these people. And I think that's something that needs to be renewed as intention every single day is just to remember that I believe, and I heard this from one of my mentors, uh, one of my Muslim mentors, that the people have a right upon me because if Allah has given me this knowledge and this passion and this expertise and this experience, then the people have a right on me to share it with others, which is why, again, it's a pleasure and honor to be here on this podcast and be able to share some of these things. So again, Jazakallah khair, man. I hope that answers the question about how the coaching program works. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, no, no, it does. You mentioned a bloat there with, with some certain parts of food and it reminded me of 
a few months ago, I came across a tweet thread that uh, has kind of stayed with me and uh, to this day. And it was breaking down the various benefits of uh, the Prophet ﷺ fasting. And we've obviously heard of some of the common ones. And obviously, like, the, like you know, it, it, the fasting increases taqwa. Um, and uh, there's d various ahadith about uh, different individuals who should fast in different scenarios, the different rewards of fasting on particular days. But this kind of broke down like some of the uh, maybe like non-obvious or, uh, or benefits of fasting from the sunnah that we don't necessarily hear as much, right? And one of them that, that hit me, or the one that really hit me was that he said that when a person is fasting, it allows their body to go into a state that we know as feeling hunger. And that feeling for some, a lot of us like feels horrible because like, oh, I'm hungry, like I need to fulfill this desire. And, uh, but what it was saying is that the, one of the benefits of that is when you're in that state, it allows your body to repair itself, i.e. Um, not from a, not just from like a muscles perspective or anything like that, but it allows uh, it like to, uh, the body to like cure, cure itself. Obviously we know that a lot of, d uh, that the diseases come from the gut. And um, when I saw that, I was like, wow, it made me, it actually made me change my perception on the feeling of hunger and now view it as a positive thing like anytime I feel that level of hunger I'm like telling myself oh like my body now I've now given my body breathing space to 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 heal itself and um and most things in life for me anyway are like psychological hacks like I'm so <laughs> I'm so fickle-minded that if I can convince myself something in my brain it 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 overpowers any physical feeling that I have and so that that did that and so um this uh a few weeks ago, I came back to, to Dubai, and uh, my family is still in the UK. Uh, it's, 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 hot, it's very hot for the kids here, so I took my family to the UK, came back by myself to, to, to do work. And so I'm here by myself, and I'm like, right, I'm going to have a bit of discipline. I'm not doing, um, I'm not doing uh, food shopping. I'm going the long way around this, but there's a, I promise there's a benefit at the end of it. So I'm not doing food shopping for the house because the kids uh, aren't here, so I don't need to go to the supermarket and get like all these groceries. It's just me, so I'm going to meal prep. So I've been meal prepping, and uh, but what I've been doing is I've also been uh, having just uh, two meals a day. Or oh, I was doing that at the beginning, right? I was doing breakfast and then like a late lunch, at like our sort of time. And I was allowing myself to feel that hunger. Uh, and one of the reasons was because of this tweet that I read. And... What had happened is then I had some friends come and visit and obviously I can't force my friends to eat like one meal a day. So I'm like bringing in food, meal plans go out the, out the window. And I started feeling that feeling again of being full after a meal. And that feeling I've always, I've always associated with a good thing. It's always been a positive feeling in my life. I'm full, that is good. Now I'm like, I'm full, this feels horrible. And now I finally understood the hadith. You know the hadith of... Um, uh, a third water, a third food, a third air. What, one of the like monumental breakthroughs in my mindset was when I had heard that a huge, often that, that hadith is um, mis, uh, I don't know, like mis explained to us or like only partly explained to us because the hadith, not in these exact words, but it says, uh, eat, uh, only eat a little or something like this. Um, and yeah. if you must eat, Oh, we missed the if. If you must eat more than a third water, third uh, food, and a third air. And often you hear people say, oh, like I've had my third of food. And it's like, no, you're not prescribed the third, man. It's like the third is like if you must. And so now I really understand that from a completely different perspective, just because I allowed myself to do two things. One, rewire what hunger means. And then two, physically experience that hunger and, and experience it in that way. And now man, bloat feels horrible. To me. I, I realized that actually my my day to day after every single meal, I didn't know what bloat was really. I thought bloat is like, you know that feeling like one time when I was younger, we went to this restaurant and I was just eating and eating and eating and eating and I felt fine. And then I stood up and I couldn't walk and that feeling was horrible. And I was like, so I always think of bloat as that, right? So that's an extreme version of bloat. But now I realize that I actually am bloated after every meal. <laughs> and, uh, and that's not a good thing at all. So uh, yeah, the hunger thing and the fasting thing, and the, I think uh, there's a lot of psychological hacks that we can do with it, but I wanted to share that with you. I thought it would like, it reminded me of it when you mentioned the bloat. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the thing with the hadith actually, is it's uh, only a few morsels of food is sufficient for the son of Adam to straighten his back. And if he must fill himself, then one third for food, one third for water, one third to save room for his breath. So 
you know, just a few morsels of food, right? Yeah, and if wow. you look at you know, how the Prophet Sallallahu lived his life, sometimes, a lot of times, like, there either wasn't food or even if there was food, he was only having, like, a couple morsels of food. And, you know, subhanAllah, it's, it's just amazing to, to see that. And can we expect ourselves to be at his level of perfection? No, but we can strive for that. And again, there's certain nutrients that you do need to hit. And there is, you know, a lot of individual needs with that. For instance, like if you're somebody with darker skin who lives in like a climate where there's not a lot of sunlight, you do need to consume a certain amount of vitamin D. You know, there's a lot of nuances to it. But the point being, the average Muslim eats way too much. The average person eats way too much. So we can all benefit from taking on that philosophy. And what you said reminds me actually of a conversation with one of my clients. Because one thing I always check in with them is, are you feeling excessively hungry? Because I don't want to set their calories too low. And actually, yeah, I had one guy say, yeah, and I had one guy say that he was enjoying the fact that he was now feeling less full because and he said exactly what you said where it's like hey i used to associate feeling full with being a good thing but now i enjoy that i have more energy and i'm more focused because not all my blood flow is going to my stomach but instead i have blood flow accessible for other areas of you know my mind and the rest of my body so it's a very important uh thing is we don't want to constantly have our stomach to be gorged with blood uh to try to digest food because that takes away blood from other areas and you'll notice it too like if you eat something makes you really bloated you're not as focused during mohara benesha and even for fudger if you're still bloated the next day and I think that's a big area where a lot of people go wrong when they fast is that Allah prescribed us fasting for many reasons, taqwa, you know, the spiritual aspect, but of course the physical aspect of preparing our bodies. But then if we go and we eat a bunch of junk food, deep fried stuff, and I have a ton of Ramadan content every Ramadan where I talk about why you shouldn't be eating these terrible foods that make you too tired to focus on tarawih and all that stuff. But like, we want to be very careful about what we eat. And obviously we have, you know, the Muharram fast coming up, right? The, the 9th and 10th. Oops, I think I'm frozen. Oh, there we go. The ninth and tenth. So obviously, when it comes to those fasts too, we want to apply the same mindset of not over engorging ourselves when it comes to iftar, so that we're not missing out on the physical benefits of fasting as well as the mental benefit of controlling our desires. So, yeah, man, I, I, like touche. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like this is uh, this is a very inspiring conversation, man. So, uh, on the basis of on the discussion of these kind of psychological hacks, uh, are there any of these psychological hacks that you've been able to find in the fitness aspect of the lifting of the going to the gym, uh, as opposed to uh, just the nutrition side? If someone is feeling uh, demotivated, how can they rewire their brain to enjoy lifting? Essentially. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. So there's a couple of different ones. I'm going to start with the Islamic one. So first and foremost, like we have to look at because if we just lived our lives the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba lived theirs, it would fix a lot of our problems, like not just in fitness, sure. but in other areas. So when you look at uh, the Sahabas, right, and or let's let's just look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was in his 50s, he was able to dig graves. The average Muslim man in his 50s right now is like too frail and decrepit to sometimes even be able to stand up for more than like a couple minutes, right? Mm. So that's the first thing. It's like just taking care of your body for the sake of Allah. You know, when I was younger uh, and still sometimes like my, my purpose of like lifting exclusively back then was, hey, I just want to look good. I just want to be strong. I want to run heavy weights. But nowadays, being looking good is still like a part of my motivation. But at the same time, it's like it's not the main motivation. It's not enough to get me to get up and go and train. The thing that gets me to get up and go and train is knowing that, number one, I want to be a stronger Muslim for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the Ummah, for the sake of my clients and everybody who depends on me to be my best. And there's actually another hadith, which is the strong believer and Mu'min al-Qawi is more beloved to Allah than the weaker believer and uh, Mu'min al-Da'if, right? And the word Qawi in Arabic that isn't just referring to spiritual strength, it's referring to all forms of strength. It's a general word for strength that means physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything. So to be more beloved to Allah is another huge motivator, but also like, again, when, when we're lifting heavy or even if we're not lifting heavy, even if we're training boxing or jiu-jitsu, whatever it may be, to be able to be a stronger and better version of ourselves physically, spiritually, mentally, for the sake of Allah, for everybody who Allah has you know, made us responsible to serve, everybody who has a right on us, that's a huge one. And now your motivation shifts. Like there's a famous, uh, or there's like a viral video that's going around on like uh, Muslim fitness on Instagram right now, where it's like, the man who goes to the gym to train to look good is blah, blah, blah. But the man who goes to become stronger for the sake of Allah, boom, 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 right? Like, it, it, so that's a, a I motivation. haven't seen that one yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay, yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. viral. I've seen a couple of the audio. I still need to use it myself because that's a good audio, but um, alhamdulillah, yeah, you'll, you'll probably see it soon, inshallah. But like- Yeah, yeah I'll look out start. for it now. Yeah, yeah. And so, that, so that's a good one. Um, I think just like finding what's your own personal why, because everybody has a different reason why this is important to them. Like for some people, they like let's say let's talk about context right if you have a 45 year old obese individual with diabetes whose father had a heart attack around the age of 45 
their motivation is going to be health where it's like, Hey, I want to be around for my kids. I want to be there for my kids. Right. Let's say you have a 35 year old who after getting married and having his first you know, child or two, he's struggling with his energy levels and he can't make it through a day of work without pounding an insane amount of coffee. And he feels like his life is closing in around him and he has no energy. His motivation is to be able to fix his energy levels by training his body, dialing in his health, dialing in his nutrition so he can perform across his daily responsibilities, both for Dean and for Dunya. Right now, let's say you have a 25 year old who's not married yet. Right. And he doesn't feel confident. He can't really speak up. He wonders, why would a woman want to be with me? You know, uh, I, I need to be a better protector. If I'm going to be able to provide for a woman, I need to fix my mindset. Then maybe for him, it's it's a matter of building his confidence. So I think contextual, mm. connecting it to your, to your dunya reasons in addition to your dean reasons and making that reason stronger than your resistance is a big thing that you can do just overall to be committed to your fitness journey. I think we as men should just be fit and strong in general because, you know, Allah has, you know, decreed for us to be a certain way as men and not to be these frail, weak, excuse making individuals, but instead to push and be disciplined. And that's a huge one because what fitness gives you is even more so mental than what it does physically for you. And I think that's a huge motivation, not only on a macro scale, but on a micro scale, knowing that by going to the gym every single day or doing some kind of workout, some kind of training, whether it's at home, whether it's calisthenics, whether it's boxing, whether it's sports, any kind of exercise is training your body, training your mind optimizing your health, making you better mentally to be able to better handle everything else you need to do that day. So I think those are many of the different motivations that we can use to psychologically motivate ourselves to be able to train every single day and be disciplined as men and for women too. I think it's important to just take care of your health and take care of your body and be the best version of you for everybody around you, you know? What's um in all of these kind of messages that you put across, like I said kind of earlier, there was there's also a slightly diverse range of these messages, right? Like some you've often spoken about respect. I've also seen some clips of you speaking to young brothers in a masjid. What's kind of been your most, um, not that it, not that numbers matter necessarily, but what's been your most kind of viral clip? I think the clip that I've seen of you that um, I first ever saw uh, where you popped up on my explore page or something was a clip where you were speaking to brothers in a masjid. And I think it was about... I think it was about calorie deficit versus calorie surplus. Maybe you're just like explaining like the basics of nutrition or something. It could have been that one. Is that was that your most viral clip, or did that just kind of come out? Oh, it was, yeah. My, my two most viral clips are the modern Muslim man morning routine, where I show my morning routine, uh, where you wake up for the hajjid, you go to the masjid for fajr, then you go to the gym, you have okay. you know a good breakfast, and then you you get to work. So that one was uh, like 1.3, 1.4 million views, something like wow. that. And then I had another one that was actually like really surprised me and I actually like took it down for a little bit, which was a mistake because it was going like super viral. But I just, the, the, the amount of arguing and ugly behavior I saw in the comments, I was just like, man, this is probably not good. So I took it down, but then I put it back up and it hasn't like gone viral, but uh, again, but it still got like 1.3 million views as well. And it was where I was talking about how canola oil is very bad for you and how you should oh, okay. use avocado oil or olive oil and how there are better oils instead. So that one was controversial because there's a bunch of people saying, I've been telling people this all along, we're in support of it. There's a bunch of people in opposition of it were like, oh, this guy is sponsored by avocado oil companies to talk bad about canola oil. And this scientist said the canola is not bad, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of funny. But actually nowadays, I'm all about that Palestinian olive oil. Palestinian olive oil is the best. You just have to be careful not to use too high of a temperature. It starts to hit a smoke point and create carcinogens. But other than that, Palestinian olive oil is the best and it's definitely better than canola oil. Canola oil is terrible for you. So I just want to make that clear. And that's a long topic that we can talk about. Actually, I have a longer video on it, like somewhere on my website that people can find if they're really interested in learning more about why canola is bad for you. But the point is uh, that one was viral. But the, the one that was really good, that was in accordance with the message of like waking up, being proactive, being the best version of yourself, the modern Muslim man morning routine. That was my favorite one that went viral and went just as viral as the canola one. So. <laughs> I've heard that a few times about the Palestinian olive oil, uh, and uh, I was able to actually I was able to get my hands on some because um, it was something for my son. Uh, there, I was having a few some issues with my son, and uh, I spoke to Sheikh Mohammed Tim Humble about it. One of the things he mentioned was to get if you can uh, olive oil, and if you can Palestinian olive oil. And I think I, yeah, I did. I managed to get my hands on some. I actually already had had some from. Um, there's a company in UK called. Uh, Ah, oh, the this that's embarrassing. The um, yeah, the name escapes me. But uh, I think there's a few places that do Palestinian olive oil. But yeah, actually that helped the the what we had to, uh, the the issue that we had at the time. Um, so yeah, you can't you can't knock stuff like that, man. And uh, look, I, I think the message that you're putting out is great. I think that 
uh, I'm definitely going to um, subscribe more to some of your uh, content and, and find out where you're putting things out. I'm hoping that you, uh, do you have an email newsletter? Uh, I have an email list, but I don't send out emails as frequently as I'd like to, but I definitely do want to start a newsletter and show one. Okay, here's what I'm going to do, man. I'm I'm about to launch an ebook about uh, the business of email newsletters because it's huge and it's only getting bigger. And I'm going to send my e that ebook over to you uh, uh, myself for free uh, in in the next coming days because I want you to read it because I think there's benefit in the Ummah if you have an email newsletter. All I want you to do is promise me, not that you'll start one, but promise me that you'll read it and that you'll at least consider it. If you don't start one after that, if I haven't convinced you in that ebook, uh, it's about 62 pages long, so forgive me in advance. <laughs> and it's a book you have to read it, it's not an audio book uh, they have to listen to. But um, I think it would be huge for you, man. I think that you'd smash it. So if you've already got an email list, uh, I kind of break down the why, the how um, it benefits you and stuff like that. And, and I think you'd kill it with that. So definitely, definitely, uh, I'm going to send that over to you and I want you to, I want you to give that a read man um absolutely absolutely and i do i do promise and commit to read it so i will inshallah and then i'm excited to be convinced to start one because yeah if it's beneficial to me and to the ummah then of course you know so i appreciate that mail will reward you man and now no worries, man look i wish you all the best with all this all the work that you're doing uh like i said inshallah you can come to uh the uae sometime soon if you do uh breakfast is on me and i say breakfast because i'm a morning person so i'm i'm so used to saying like conforming like our oh, dinner's on me and then i'm like the worst dinner um i'm the worst dinner company ever i i went for dinner uh, about two nights ago and i felt so bad for the brother man like we we're meeting we arranged a dinner i was like it was like 9 30 p.m by the time we had dinner i was like the worst so yeah if you're ever in the uae breakfast is on me inshallah and uh, it'll be lovely to connect is anything else that you want to kind of mention before we uh, lock off the, the pod inshallah well hey if breakfast is on you then the workout's on me we'll we'll eat and then train Sounds or train good. and then eat whatever you prefer and inshallah it'll be a good time so just all fair but yeah no i, I just want to say i appreciate you having me on the podcast um you know maybe when i come to the uae we can do one in person inshallah and of course for you sure. know for any of the viewers sure. anything any questions that you have uh, feel free to like, you know, drop a comment or, you know, anything that if we do another podcast, inshallah, she wants to discuss, please let us know. Again, the purpose of this is to serve you as the viewer and to serve the ummah. So again, anything else that we can do to serve you, please let, please let us know, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Munir. And uh, we'll connect. I'll grab your details over um, just after this call and then I can throw them in the description as well for the, of the podcast. Thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, thank you for watching this episode of Freshly Grounded uh, with the modern Muslim man. Uh, inshallah, I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.